Well, it seems appropriate for me to say welcome and cheers, since I don't think we have any prohibitionists on stage. But uh, we do appreciate you attending tonight and addressing this very important, uh, very compelling state question, 792, that will be on the ballot November 8th. And um, I wanted to start by just asking, I'll start with the senator. Uh, you know, more than 30 years ago, we passed liquor by the drink in Oklahoma. And ever since then, despite no wine or strong beer in grocery stores or convenience stores, there hasn't exactly been a scarcity of drinking in Oklahoma, whether in good times, good economic times, or bad. So state question 792 would bring wine and full strength beer into those types of store, stores. You're a co-author of this bill, so please, Senator, explain why this change is good and how it would benefit the public as a whole. Well, there's a couple of reasons why I began this journey of really modernizing our alcohol laws. Uh, the first one is Oklahoma is one of five states left that mandates 3-2 beer, or what we call low-point beer. Uh, Colorado, Kansas, Minnesota, Utah, and Oklahoma, um, and Colorado, actually. And looking at the way that our current structure is set up, it would require a state question to be able to move to what we would consider a single strength system. So in looking at that, in addition to allowing for wine and grocery and convenience stores, the realization was there's going to be a lot more to this. The benefit is most states are offering something similar to this. They're not, they don't have a two tier system for beer and they, many of them are offering wine um, as an option in, in grocery and convenience. So this was, was really the start of a conversation to figure out, you know, how could we make that happen? I will add, though, it's not just a alcohol issue. This is also an economic development issue. It affects uh, grape growers and wineries in Oklahoma, and it also affects the craft brew industry in Oklahoma. So this is really an all-encompassing um, piece of legislation that will move us uh, in a uh, forward direction. Uh, Mr. Kerr, uh this system we have has been in place for decades, and really the liquor store industry has resisted change, wanting to protect its business. And meanwhile, consumers increasingly seem to want more options, choices, craft beers, convenience of wine in the store, uh, being able to go out on Sunday night when they realize they don't have enough wine the next day for a, the holiday dinner. But now under public pressure, uh, the, the liquor store industry is willing to propose changes that would be phased in and contain restrictions, although that state question 791 uh, uh, will apparently will not make the ballot. So why do you oppose 792? Well, David, first let me say, um, and I hate to get disagreeable this quickly with you in particular sure, since no, that's we right. just met. But uh, the the initial part of your question is only somewhat correct. The Retail Liquor Association and liquor stores in general have not opposed uh, changes to the liquor laws. My predecessor, J.P. Richard, who is in the audience tonight, fought for years at the legislature in order to get changes made. Uh, it did have some success. It, for those that are uh, old enough, you, you will remember that we used to not be able to sell on election days for, for some god-awful reason, and the reason is actually Texas. Uh, and so the, <laughs> the, uh, we got that passed. The, uh, there, was a, there was a restriction in place that would not allow both a husband and a wife to own package store licenses. Uh, that got changed because obviously there, there was an unfairness there. And so uh, the Retail Liquor Association in particular, even previous to all of this coming to fruition, uh, we were on board with a lot of these changes. It, it, would, it may surprise some people, uh, as a matter of fact, how many things Senator Bice and I actually agree on. Uh, those will not be talked about much tonight, but there are many things where we are actually in line. Our first meeting that we had together when I sat down at her desk at the Capitol, uh, and she and her Bill 383 was proposing cold beer in liquor stores, and that was it. I said, as an organization, we're neutral on this because economic concerns and rural concerns, but personally, I'm all for it. I like the idea that consumers deserve it. Um, 
And so it's unfair to say that we are not, that we don't want change or that we have historically resisted change. There's some of us in the industry that have historically always wanted change, and I happen to be one of those guys. Uh, with that said, 792 is not the change I want. Uh, and it's not the change that I think is good for Oklahoma. It's not the change that I, it is the change that I know is not good for Oklahoma liquor stores. So I'll just address uh, one of Senator Bice's early points, which was the economic development argument, which is one of my least favorite arguments that the proponents of 792 make. Uh, because what they've done is they've cherry-picked, and in this case, grape-picked, a, uh, a particular industry. Uh, the Hops picked? Can we add that as well? You can have right. that. Yeah, I like that. Do you pick? Um, and uh, and they, so they've picked specific cottage industries, uh, and wh wh whom I support, by the way, and for those that are in the audience that heard about 424 getting the favorable opinion today, good job for the Attorney General making that happen. That is absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, but at the same time, what we're talking about is a net loss to Oklahoma when we talk about 792. So for every brewery that will open, for every tourist that might come in and tour those breweries, for every uh, additional uh, freedom that winery get, a winery gets in Oklahoma, uh, you're closing down, you're, you're losing 10 jobs and closing down a liquor store or two liquor stores or five liquor stores. So the offset there just doesn't make any sense economically. You know, there are, I think there's still a lot of confusion over this uh, question. And um, so I'd like to ask just a, uh, some basic questions, and perhaps the senator is most capable of answering these, about, what, about the, what the effects would be. So if 792 passes, would that mean every grocery or convenience store in the state be allowed to sell refrigerated strong beer and wine, even in a county that doesn't allow a liquor by the drink that is dry? Those counties would have two years to um, pass legislation to allow for them to decide whether or not they wanted to have full strength beer and wine. But in counties that do have that option, they would be able to have full strength beer and refrigerated, um, refrigerated full strength beer and wine in grocery and convenience stores with a couple of caveats. And that is there is a cap on the alcohol. Uh, ABV for beer and wine at 8.99 and 15% alcohol. Those higher alcohol content products will still be uh, exclusive to liquor stores. And if, if I may add to that, it's not just grocery and convenience stores that would be eligible to sell strong beer and wine, and Senator Bice can speak on this if she likes, but it's literally any retail outlet, according to SQ 792. So if the nail salon wanted to get a beer and, a beer and wine license, they could sell it seven days a week, virtually 20 hours a day. If the car mechanic wanted to get a beer and wine license, they could sell it. There's no restriction. The language actually says specifically these, these entities, grocery stores, super centers, convenience stores, gas stations, but it is not limited to those entities. It says includes but not limited to. So we could be looking at beer and st strong beer and wine in any number of additional outlets. My prediction would be about 4,000. It could be as many as 7,000 new outlets. I would disagree with that assessment uh, that there's never been a discussion about allowing for um, liquor and, and full beer and wine to be sold in those other entities. Could that be an option moving forward? I suppose so, but that's never been the intent and it's not listed anywhere in Senate Bill 383 or in state, uh, 792. Okay. Respectfully, Senator, the language does say will include but is not limited to. L not limited to, but according to the language that it's written as it stands right now, that's never been an option. Another question. Will you be able to buy strong beer and wine on Sunday and on most holidays and early in the morning and late at night? Would you like to answer that question? Uh, well, of course. I mean, the 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 answer is yes. The the uh, as the bill is written, as 792 is written, uh, does it, that doesn't really address it. Senator Bice's um, statutory bill, SB 383, is what sets out the days and hours of operation. And the days of hour, hours of operation to buy strong beer and wine, unless you own a liquor store are seven days a week except between the hours of 2 a.m. and 7 a.m. Now, if you happen to own a retail package store, you have to close on Sunday. You can only be open until midnight, and you can only open at 10 a.m. Um, and I assume that's because we sell, sell spirits. Um, I, there, there is no logical basis for that other than selling spirits. 
uh, although uh, we can get into the public safety issues later, which are mostly caused not by spirits, but by beer. However, I understand where that policy comes from. It's something that's kind of deep rooted into, into, the, uh, into the America's psyche. But wouldn't uh, you agree though, um, that when we had our discussions that you mentioned earlier, that um, extended hours was really not something that you all were advocating for? Oh no, Senator, don't get me wrong. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not advocating for it now. I, from a public safety standpoint, I don't even want uh, retail package stores to be open until midnight. I think it's wise to close them l at the latest 10 p.m. But I also think it's wise to close convenience and grocery stores alcohol sales at that time in order to keep more people from being on the road or getting alcohol when they shouldn't have it. So from a public safety standpoint, and I'm not a public safety expert, but studies will tell you that it absolutely is better from a public safety standpoint, if you don't open liquor stores or strong alcohol outlets later hours. Do we get to ask a follow-up? Sure. <laughs> go ahead. So with, with your explanation, should we go ahead and also close all uh, restaurants and bars at 9 p.m. as well and not oh, offer the ability to sell product on premise? Yeah, that's a great question. Such a great question that everybody wearing Bice's right shirts clapped for it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, so uh, the an the answer to that is, of course, there is there is a difference between on premise and off premise sales, and so on -premise, there you and take it home and drink it, the, and on premise you're drinking it and then getting in the car and driving. No, you don't. There, there. The problem is the reason that bars and restaurants. There's a reason bars and rest restaurants close at two a.m. So I'll throw that question back to you. Would you be in favor of bars and restaurants serving alcohol twenty four hours a day? And if not, why not? I don't, know, I don't know that that's ever been addressed or asked. Okay. Let's, uh, j just another couple of informational questions. Uh, they could also be debate questions. And that is, uh, and I think I know the answer to this one, Senator. Can large publicly held chains like Walmart or 7-Eleven uh, own package liquor stores? No. They're attempting to do so in Texas. Do you see that on the horizon at any point? No, not that I'm interested okay. in at this time. Mm -mm. And finally... That was easy. Could I have wine shipped to my house from a wine club outside the state, and if so, under what rules uh, and what costs? Yes, with one caveat, and that is if the wine is available in the state of Oklahoma for sale at a retail package store, then you are not able to ship it into the state of Oklahoma. And that was a consideration given to the package stores to make sure that people weren't going online and buying wine in bulk. Uh, and uh, those retail package stores would be missing out on those sales. So most wine clubs that sell monthly uh, shipments that you would receive are selling them um, specialty wines, uh, reserves, and things that you wouldn't be able to buy in a, a liquor store currently, and so that you would be able to participate in those. Would I need a, isn't there some language in the law about a wine consumer license? There is. And what, what would it take for me to get a, a wine consumer license? Apply. It, do it cost me anything? I think it's a, I, I believe it's around $30. It's an inexpensive license. Okay. Okay, question for either or both of you. Will prices on beer and wine go down as if 792 passes? We don't know. We, we actually don't know. Um, so we can speculate. And the, my answer, of course, is and has always been prices will go up. Uh, and the reason for that is because 792 fundamentally restructures the way uh, distribution is handled in Oklahoma. And it takes it from a forced open competitive system into a franchise quasi monopoly, a monopoly system where uh, instead of having competition at the wholesale level, the people I buy from, the people that the liquor store owners in the audience buy from, we now, instead of buying from a competitive system where six guys or seven guys or how many other guys who decide to be in that business compete against each other in price selection and service, it essentially takes that down to two guys. And they have sole representation of the products that they contract to have representation of. So instead of a retail package store owner buying Jack Daniels from one of six different guys in Oklahoma, uh, SQ792 would likely cause me to have the choice of buying it from one guy. And I don't, I don't know how, uh, how business works in, uh, in everywhere or at your house, but if you're the only guy selling Jack Daniels in an entire area, you're going to probably take a pretty good profit on that Jack Daniels. Uh, if I was the only store in Moore selling alcohol, as much as I love my customers, and I do, I would still 
definitely up my margins. And so uh, that's what we're looking at it with 792, a price increase as a result of a restructure at the, uh, that's one of the problems. Senator, what do you think? I disagree. And I have um, data to show that um, there are wines in Texas that are currently under the Texas model for distribution, which is sort of the model that we're looking at, sort of. um, that are actually lower uh, than Oklahoma's current system. The distribution model in the state, I think, is flawed, and that is because we force uh, a manufacturer to sell to every wholesaler that wants to purchase the product. And in my opinion, those manufacturers should be allowed to choose which wholesaler they sell through. Um, if a wholesaler is providing great service and quality, um, they should be selected to be able to carry that product. The new legislation doesn't limit how many wholesalers can carry the product. It says at least one. So if a manufacturer wants two, three, four, or five wholesalers to uh, sell their product, they have that ability. And furthermore, with the option to sell in so many new places, I think it makes opportunity for some of these wholesalers to really expand their business models. So let me pull back the curtain a little bit on what Senator Bice just said. It does, she's absolutely correct. I do not disagree with her, and she's not lying. The problem is the reality versus the fantasy of this. So there's a reason that the two biggest wholesalers in the state of Oklahoma are supporting SQ 792 and the other five wholesalers are vehemently opposed to it. And that's because they know the reality of it is there will be two wholesalers left in the state of Oklahoma when this is all said and done. That is a monopoly at the highest level and it's going to raise prices. I, I disagree. <laughs> I would say that as a consumer. I, I will say that your comment at the beginning there was very telling, and that is, we don't know. And so I think that needs to be clear. We don't know, and there's proof to show otherwise as well. Yeah, the, well, uh, I'm sorry, Dave. All right, let's, let's move on. Um, uh, question for Senator Bice. This uh, 792, if approved, uh, would take effect in October 2018. That is correct. Why wait so long? There are a lot of complicated pieces to this puzzle. It is not just beginning to ship wine to research. Um, it is licensing issues. It is the county option that we talked about earlier. Uh, it is enforcement. It is training. There are a lot of pieces to this puzzle. And I, we also needed to make sure that um, we had enough time to run any follow-up legislation that we felt was um, critical to ensuring that this is successful. And this gives us two follow-up sessions to do just that. Uh, a question for both of you, and maybe it's a quick answer, and that is, if a 792 passes, will consumption of alcohol increase in Oklahoma? There's no evidence to show that. Yes, there is evidence. Uh, it won't increase much, however. Uh, there have been numerous studies done uh, as alcohol is made available in more places that there is increased alcohol consumption. Uh, the problem is not so much with the increased alcohol consumption. The problem is the increased alcohol consumption amongst people who should not have it. Uh, and so when you talk about 792 and you talk about strong beer and wine-based products going into new outlets, you're talking about giving it access to people that normally would not have access to anything but 3-2 beer, which, of course, gets you to the point where you shouldn't be more slowly and so there is a little less danger in that. So when we talk about stronger alcohol being in the additional places, there will be more people that are drinking it, and some of those people, unfortunately, will be people that should not be drinking. I will mention that I was surprised to see a chart, uh, a graphic uh, put out by a national beer distributors group that shows that alcohol consumption nationally really has not increased. It's fairly flat over a long period of time you would think it would have gone up. It just moves between beer and wine and spirits, and one is leading, and the hot dog is ahead, and then the relish caps up, so. Right, yeah. At, at, the, at the same time, we are unfortunately at a 35-year high for alcohol-related re deaths in, in the United States. So uh, there is some work that needs to be done there to help prevent that. 792 does none of that work. Is the Retail Liquor Association going to sue if 792 passes? Of course. Okay. So. And the Constitution, uh, and the, so the, go ahead. May I sure. follow up with that? So my question is, you mentioned earlier that you felt like that you were supporting change and you were, you were not being obstructionist, but it seems as though um, because you're not pleased with all of the 
um, changes that you're going to be obstructionist in every step of the way from filing your own initiative petitions to suing um, for constitutionality of this one, which I will add, you have the same constitutionality issues in 791 that you claim are in 792. So some of the, there, there is some, at least on the surface, uh, conflicts there, and, and I apologize to that for uh, for that to everyone that is just pure ignorance on my part when we put that petition together we thought we were putting together a good compromise uh, we did not realize at the time that the constitutional issues may exist once we examined it spoke with people that were smarter than me uh, realized that there are equal protection issues possibly in both now as far as being obstructionist senator i am um, working my tail off to try to get something together that will work. And luckily, since 792 is not supposed to go into effect until October of 2018, we still have time to do that. And we could do it. We could even do it before 2018 if we work together to get something that works sensibly for everybody. So you mentioned that um, there are constitutionality issues because of equal protection. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with the discussions that have been had about 791 and 792, uh, the uh, concerns are that it limits liquor store owners to two licenses and it also limits who can hold a wine license. No limit on beer licenses. Um, I think the concern is that the provisions that you put in 791 would limit a wine license to no closer than 500 feet of an existing grocery store. Is that correct? That, no. That's, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. A wine license within 500 feet of a liquor store. No, Senator, that's not a concern, actually, because that was uh, what was challenged in our petition by the Grocers Association already in front of the Oklahoma Supreme Court. That was their sole challenge to it. The Supreme Court ruled in our favor that that did not violate equal protection. My understanding was the number of the licenses was the equal protection issue, not the distance between uh, wine licenses and an existing retail package store license. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, I got a little confused. I thought you were asking why our petition was unconstitutional. No, what I'm asking is how can you argue for equal protection in one instance, but you're trying to pass a, another state question with the same sort of language? Well, our, you know, in fairness, our language in 791 does have limited grocery store licenses as well as limited liquor store licenses with a slow rollout of grocery store licenses. That's a key difference in how the marketplace is viewed, and we think the Supreme Court will agree with that. Uh, final question before we go to the audience. Uh, there are concerns about the social costs of 792 or 791, any, any increasing access to, to beer, to strong beer and wine. Do you have any view on whether we're going to see any costs that need to be addressed? And if so, how would we pay for those? Would they cost anything? This is the public safety aspect was a very important discussion for me. I am the mother of two daughters. One is a teenager. One will be a soon to be teenager. Um, these are things I looked at very closely. I had conversations with mental health and substance abuse about this. Some of the provisions that are in Senate Bill 383, which I think are very relevant to this conversation, are that. Uh, age of sale is 18 for beer and wine, 21 for spirits. And in current statute, you can be as young as 16 to sell beer in a grocery or convenience store. And let's not kid ourselves, 3-2 beer is alcohol. I'm pretty certain most of you in this room that attended um, college can attest to that fact. It is an intoxicating substance. So we do need to have protections in place to, to uh, ensure that we're not uh, selling to youth. The, the second piece of that is we're also requiring licensing. Those individuals that want to sell alcohol have to be licensed. And third, they have to be trained. None of those provisions are currently in statute. You can walk into a convenience store, apply as a 16-year-old, and start selling beer. And virtually uh, none of the independent grocery or convenience stores have any sort of formal training program on, on how to check for IDs, who you shouldn't sell to, when you should get a manager involved. So I think that we are trying to do our best to make sure that we are looking at those licensing provisions and those public safety issues very, very carefully. So we agree on the larger point that you should do what you can in order to protect youth access from alcohol. Uh, and I support the training, the training provision that Senator Bice referred to, uh, the licensing of employees through the ABLE Commission. But the reality is this. It's reducing the age at which people will be selling stronger alcohol. It's plain and simple. 
and that's to 18 from currently 21. And I'm sorry, let me make the point that it's reducing it only in convenience and grocery stores because in, in SB 383, package store owners still have to employ 21-year-olds. And to Senator Bice's point, you really can get just as drunk on six-point beer as you can on Jack Daniels. And so to say that I have to be 21 to sell at a liquor store as a matter of public safety, but then to say it's okay if an 18-year-old sells 14% wine or 8% beer is disingenuous because it gets you to the same spot eventually. There needs to be more, not less, regulations in place for convenience in grocery stores so that we can protect the wrong people from getting this stuff and from hurting themselves. Which is exactly what I'm doing, sir, because right now you're 16 and able to sell beer in a grocery and convenience store, and you're not licensed and you're not trained. Yes, Senator. By the way, you can call me Brian. We know each other. You don't have to call okay. me sir. <laughs> Let's open it <laughs> that to that the throws audience. me a little bit. Right. Uh, we have a question over here. <laughs> Hi, my name is LaJan Fields. As the mother and grandmother of a young man, his fiance, and a 22-month-old baby that were killed by a drunk driver, my question for you is this convenience, this increased revenue, how many more lives are we going to have to lose because of it? We have... The state of Oklahoma has spent a tremendous amount of energy, including a governor's initiative on NDUI. So don't think for one minute that that's not a, a concern that we all have um, and that we'll, we will be uh, advocating for making sure that uh, those, uh, those programs continue in the future. Um, it, th I will also add that there are a lot of laws that have been passed very recently, including one by Representative Mike Sanders, which talk about uh, criminal reporting for DUI cases to make sure that... Yeah. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. question for you yes. is simply, how many more lives are you willing to give up for this convenience? This is not about giving up. Look, the reality is that we have some of the strictest alcohol laws in the entire U.S. as it relates to sales of spirits. So people are going to be able to, uh, they're drinking regardless of whether they can buy it um, in a liquor store past 9 p.m. or in a bar or, or restaurant. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Do we have another question over here? Oh, goodness. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Brian. Um, you've said that you're against 792 because of the uh, public safety issues and um, potential dangers to the public. Uh, the National Beverage Control Association released a study uh, evaluating the per cost capita of excessive drinking in each state. It said that states that do not allow uh, supermarket sales of beer and wine have an average cost of $827 per capita whereas states allowing beer and wine sales in grocery store, that drops to or $787. How do you respond to that? I'm not going to. The, um, the problem with that is you can cherry pick any information you want off the internet and bring it up. I don't, I don't honestly even understand what the costs mean there. What I will tell you is that S as SQ 792 and SB 383 reduces the penalty for selling to a minor from a felony to a misdemeanor, from a $2,500 to $5,000 fine and jail time and loss of license to a $500 maximum uh, monetary fine and no jail time. I can tell, and I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know your name, so I, I can't respond directly uh, with your name, but I will, I will answer this like that. There are many, many studies that absolutely show that when an 18-year-old is in charge of selling alcohol, they will sell it much more often to somebody under the age of 21, and that's something we need to prevent here in the state of Oklahoma. I agree we need stricter laws, and one of the reasons we have the problem that you pointed out is because the laws are currently so lax in the convenience and grocery store area. Thank you. Well, I think the good news to that, to that point is what most people don't realize is 3-2 beer is not regulated um, by ABLE. They're actually regulated by the Tax Commission and local law enforcement, which is another issue. By passing State Question 792 and Senate Bill 383, all of that is moved under the ABLE Commission. So in my belief, enforcement will actually be better because that's going to be their sole focus is making sure that uh, we're not selling to underage. And We can hope. So. Yeah, that, that would be nice. Another question from the audience. Hello, I'm from a rural area, 
And after reading through Senate Bill 383, I'm trying to figure out what is the economic benefits for a rural area when it comes to your bill. I, I have a 16-year-old son as well, and I'm concerned about access. Sure. Well, just like I mentioned a minute ago, that one of the things I think that has been missed in this conversation is the 3-2 um, uh, sales portion that's not regulated by ABLE. I think moving it under... Uh, I'm sorry, that's not regulated by, well, not regulated by ABLE, it's regulated by the tax commission right now. Putting all of that under ABLE will really help. To your point about uh, the rural issue, though, there's actually an economic development um, piece of this for rural Oklahoma, and that is the wine growers. Most people don't realize that um, Oklahoma was one of the top producing grape growing states in the U.S. before prohibition. Um, rural communities were thriving off of the, sale, the growing and, and uh, manufacturing of wines in Oklahoma. And after that, um, that industry vanished. So there's a huge opportunity in rural Oklahoma to redevelop and revitalize those jobs in the communities. Um, nothing, by the way, is stopping them from doing that now, Senator. There's nothing stopping someone from opening a winery right now in rural Oklahoma. This makes it a little bit easier for them, and it actually increases the availability of them to distribute as well. Another question. In the middle. Oh, oh yeah, um, hello, Ann Richard Farina. I'm actually the attorney for the Retail Liquor Association. I and I saw I have a you question. at the court. At yes, the, uh, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. I didn't get to meet you then, but hello. I have a question for you regarding the 20% restriction on non-alcoholic products that state question 792 puts on package stores, but there's no corresponding restriction on the sale of alcoholic products by grocery stores, convenience stores, pharmacies, and the like. Can you please explain why that is the case? What sure. is the purpose behind that? Absolutely. So one of the concerns from a public safety perspective was having a, um, a liquor store become a de facto convenience store that sold liquor. And so we had to figure out what we could do to address that issue. And the really the, the policy that we came up with was if we limited what the liquor stores were able to sell, still allowing them to sell other products, mixers, wines, wine glasses, corkscrews, that sort of thing, um, it, we would still keep that access, uh, spirits access under uh, liquor store purview. Uh, what's uh, another question? We need to speak into the mics over here. So I have two questions, kind of. So one, why would we lower the penalties for underage selling? And then also, what was the opposition to 791 from your side? Um, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the opposition to 791. I'm here to advocate for 792. So I'm not going to, I really can't address that portion of it. Um, as far as lowering the age, one of the um, concerns, I'm sorry. Well, they also, because the other part of that is they'll lose their license, so they're not going to be able to sell any longer, whereas with, you know, um, current statute, I don't know if that's even... It is. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, they would actually lose their license as well. They have, the, if they were to sell to a, a, to a minor, they would no longer be able to sell in a store. So, um, if I'm 18 years old and I'm working at the uh, Mini Mart and my 18-year-old girlfriend comes in, I might lose my license if I sell beer and strong wine to her. And there would be a, a, penal, a civil penalty for Possibly, that? Possibly, yeah. Mm -hmm. A question here. Uh, regarding the, uh, the move to have ABLE regulate all this, does the bill create positions for ABLE officers? They have those abilities now. And the licensing fees that'll be in place will actually allow for them to hire more staff to beef up. They'll have the funding to be able to do that. I have a quick question, perhaps for the senator or either one of you. Do you think uh, there's been talk among the mental health and substance abuse services community about trying to raise more funding to address our huge addiction issues in the state? Do you think this will create an opportunity for them to try and raise the liquor tax, which hasn't been raised since 1987, to fund some of that? Well, we do have some of the highest taxes on liquor in the United States already, so that's going to be a tough one. Senator. I will say that the current structure for taxes does not include 3-2 beer um, under the consumption tax. 
So there is a discussion about whether or not there would be a increase in or a, a tax consumption tax on full strength beer moving forward. There will be actually additional tax revenue. Senator Bice did write into SB 383 um, about 80 to 85 percent of the beer sold in Oklahoma is 3-2 beer. It will be strong beer and it will be taxed at the higher rate at which strong beer is currently taxed. So uh, beer will cost a little bit more under 383 as a result, but that, that money will go to the government. So people that are fans of the government having money, it'll get some. That actually was not addressed completely and it will be readdressed next session. Okay. Um, a question here, this gentleman. Uh, Senator Bryce, I'd like to back up a moment. As I understand it from the comments, we in the liquor industry, and I'm a liquor retailer, if we sell the wine and strong beer, our employees uh, face a felony charge, which is pretty serious. Mm -hmm. But in the grocery business and the convenience stores, uh, under your bill, it's just a misdemeanor to sell the same product. Can you forget it's not regulated now, but now that's apples and oranges. Why didn't your bill have in it to keep it on par with the liquor stores be a felony too? No, the, that's not accurate. Actually, 383 doesn't doesn't charge a felony for sales under a liquor store. We've actually leveled the playing field, which is one of the requests that the um, liquor association had. Uh, let me let me clarify. We did not ask for the penalty to be a misdemeanor at any point during our negotiations. I wanted it to remain a felony for everybody. I never wanted the penalties to be reduced. But Senator Bice is right. The playing field will be level. If one of our employees sells to a minor, they will also only face a misdemeanor. And, and one of the, I think, things that needs to be addressed here, oh, I'm glad you asked. So one of the things that needs to, that you all need to know is that if you are convicted of a felony in, in this state, you are restricted uh, on what licenses you can obtain. For example, uh, a cosmetology license, an electrician's license, there are a host of licenses that the state of Oklahoma will not give you if you've been convicted of a felony. So from a economic standpoint, it's, it's, it's not in the best interest of the state to give everybody a felony. We just actually went through criminal justice reform to address the fact that we have, you know, a, a high incarceration rates and high, you know, um, conviction rates on certain felonies. So we're trying to balance that, that issue. That's another state question to deal with. Um, yes, over here. Hi, Senator Tobias. Hi, Vance. <laughs> I, as you know, I have several concerns about 792. You uh, don't say. I know. What would be your question? <laughs> uh, one of the main concerns I have is uh, after the vote, if 792 passes and is certified, uh, liquor stores will not be allowed to sell non-alcoholic products until October 1 of 2018. What was the reasoning behind that if this is all about consumer um, convenience. I think that was just part of the overall package. Everything goes into effect at the same time. Senate Bill 383 and State Question 792 went hand in hand, and so they were all um, enacted at the same time. We didn't really want to piecemeal together different pieces. I think it makes it confusing in some ways, so it was a package deal. Thank you. Question here. Uh, Senator, I'm Charlie Potts, and I, I'm, I'm fine with up, updating our liquor laws uh, to some extent. I like beer. I, I just drink 3.2 beer. What I'm concerned about is making high point beer available in many more locations than it is now because we have a problem with alcoholism in Oklahoma now. I can't imagine why this won't make it worse. So why is, why is the, one of the emphasis on this to put high point beer in grocery stores? Well, I'll, I'll, there's two points to that. The first one is that if you look at other states that don't have a 3-2 provision in them, they're selling um, what we consider full-strength beer in grocery stores and convenience stores, uh, and some of them have higher alcohol rates, uh, alcoholism rates than Oklahoma does. So I don't, I'm not sure that the correlation for selling a full-strength beer in a grocery and convenience store really equates to higher alcoholism issues. And I think you even addressed something along those lines earlier. Um, this is really about moving away from the two-tier system. We, you know, we're like I mentioned earlier, we're only one of five states left that have this three-two versus full-strength beer um, provision, and because of that, we're sort of unique. Uh, and I really want us to sort of move forward in that, and that's why we're looking at making the change. Question back there. 
Hi, I had a question first uh, about the, the penalty. And Mr. Lester. Yes, hello, Senator Bice, how are you? Doing well. Thanks. Um, I had a question about the penalty. So how many people are currently prosecuted once they receive um, a citation for selling to a minor? How many people are actually prosecuted as a felon um, all the way through the system? And what percentage of those would you say are sort of uh, plea bargained down to something lesser as it stands? Because I, I think when we see issues like uh, there was a case in Delaware County where um, she did receive a felony, the clerk that sold, but they had her on uh, videotape selling five different times to the same minor um, and neglecting to check the ID. So where do we have, if, as it stands right now, we have a system to deal with somebody who is very neglectful in their duties. When you take away um, that ability for prosecutors, uh, where do we go from there with that? I think there's like five questions in there, and I'm really not sure which one you wanted me to answer, quite honestly. Um, the last one being, how do, you know, how do you prevent somebody from continuing to sell um, habitually? Well, you know, we talked about the licensing provision, and if, they're, um, if they are found to be guilty of selling to underage, one of the provisions is that ABLE can revoke their license. Let, let me, if I would, if I could, just address access from another standpoint, too, because it's not just the selling of alcohol to minors, it's a problem. Theft is a problem, too. Uh, and when you look at the statistics, grocery stores and convenience stores are three times more likely to experience theft of alcohol than liquor stores. That's worldwide. Um, Quick Trip itself, just two years ago in the Tulsa world, there was an article that said beer runs epidemic at Quick Trip. Just last year, a guy walked into Quick Trip, literally carried out 30 packs, 12 of them, two at a time, to the sidewalk out in front of Quick Trip, loaded them into a Suburban. He and his friend got away with 12 30 packs at Quick Trip, a well-lighted, well-known, well-staffed, fully cameraed facility and just stole that beer. Now, that happening at a liquor store, I can guarantee you as a liquor store owner, that ain't gonna happen. Well, but I'd people like are not to gonna get you out. That. Do, you, do you see that trend in other states where they sell strong beer and wine in grocery stores in Dallas and Texas and Arizona? And Any, anytime that you have increased access points, you have, obviously you have easier theft. Anytime you have products in larger stores, you have more theft. Anytime you have company policies that say do not chase a, a shoplifter, which is the company policy of most chain stores, including Walmart, Quick Trip, Walgreens, etc., then you have more theft. And so, yes, you absolutely see theft in other states. In Texas, for instance, and everybody will remember this case, the affluenza case, the kid that stole beer, drove into four people, killed them, pled he was too rich to go to jail, got off of jail, Irrelevant, he stole the beer from Walmart. Him and his friends, 16 year olds, walked in, grabbed it, ran out, he blew it to four. Now that's gonna happen much less likely in a controlled environment with 21 year old employees. It simply is. Is there as a question here? Thank you. Hi, uh, my question is actually for both panelists. If your state question passes, who do you think stands to profit the most financially? I think there are a lot of entities that have the ability. I, I don't. <laughs> Mr. Kerr, what do you think? Yeah, so the, um, yeah. So the uh, peanut gallery aside, the, the truth of that matter is that the, the big winners in this are the people that supported it the, the heaviest. And I will tell you the answer is Walmart. The answer is Quick Trip. The answer is Anheuser-Busch. The answer is Miller Coors. And the answer is the two big wholesalers that helped get this thing through the legislature. And that's why they supported it so vehemently. They don't give a damn about the Oklahoma consumer. They don't care how much freedom we have in Oklahoma. They just wanna make money. They don't, they don't live here. They don't have kids here. They don't have to worry about what happens in rural Oklahoma. They don't care if the girl, the lady in ceiling that's 78 year old has been drunk, has a liquor store for 25 years, goes out of business. It doesn't matter to them. So I'll follow up with that. 
Um, it doesn't matter to you that the craft brewers uh, are going to be able to do things they've never been done to, done before and grow their industries. And supported that all along, Senator. You and know that. that there are hundreds of independent grocery and convenience stores across this state. We're doing fine as is. So you want to limit the ability for them to grow because you don't want to give up the beer and wine and grocery and convenience. Again, stores. we're talking. Again, we're talking about where the majority of the money is going to go, and I have nothing against other local businesses, but they opened their business based on a specific model that had nothing that to do with selling a product. That is 57 years old. Right, it's that they've known changed. about for 57 years, exactly. A question over here. Mm -hmm. so okay, so I don't own a liquor store. I don't, I don't own a grocery store. I don't stand to benefit in any way except for when we moved to Oklahoma from Wisconsin 30, almost 40 years ago, I had a baby. And I went to a liquor store to buy a six pack of beer, unbuckled my baby, take him into the store, and they said, you can't come in here with that baby because somehow or other, that's against the law. Uh, our liquor laws need to be modernized and Mm -hmm. so I look your, forward to doing the best job we can to do it, but if we don't do something, we're going to continue to live in the dark ages. You have a question. So my question, my question is, I was told at that time that the reason we had these laws is because of religious grounds, because uh, many of the people in the Bible Belt objected to it. So uh, from either of you, yeah. have you heard strong objections or objections from churches, from the religious community about this bill? Good question. I don't hang out in the religious community. I'm Catholic. <laughs> so, no. And, that, and that's the answer. <laughs> uh, there's a question in the back here. Hi, I'm Megan Richard, co-owner of Cash Road Liquor and Wine. Hi, Megan. Uh, we've met before. Um, I wanted to ask you, Senator Bice, you mentioned earlier about the NDY program that Michael Sanders kind of headed up. Were you aware that he voted against 383 and um, 792 or 68 as it was when it was going through the legislature? Yeah, uh, let me clarify the point though. He didn't advocate, or he wasn't part of the NDUI program. He actually ran some legislation that would make it um, easier for um, repeat offenders of DUI to have their licenses revoked and for, that, for them to serve accordingly, sentences accordingly. Um, that's a district vote. Uh, he may have had folks in his district that were adamantly opposed to that, um, and I respect that. And I'm sorry, if I could back up to this young lady's question on Wisconsin. Um, we, there's areas, I said, where we agree, and one of those areas is people should be, be able to bring their baby into my liquor store. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, the legislation still prevents that doesn't prevent it, it doesn't, it doesn't um, allow for it either. That was something that I told you when we talked about it that we would look at running next session. Okay, but currently SB 383 says you have to be 21 to enter a liquor store and it's always going to continue to be the way it is unless you get it changed. Yes, that's so true. It's still there at the moment. Fair enough. Okay. Right here. Okay, I have a question and a comment. The first question is, uh, currently the law states that package store owners must be residents of the state for 10 years. Um, is, does, is any changes to that? And my question also is, when you open this up to large corporations like Walmart, like Quick Trip, 7-Eleven, you're taking that Oklahoma money from Oklahoma residents and sending that money out of state. Now, the second thing that I wanna say is this. If you think that your selection of craft beer in a grocery store is gonna be any different than it is now, you are sorely mistaken. MBEV, Anheuser-Busch, Heineken, Miller Coors will protect that refrigeration space with their products, and I would venture to guess that craft brewers will see very little space in those Thank outlets. You. Thank you. Uh, I didn't, the first part of that question, Sorry, 
I think you're asking it. You think that the majority of the money is going to benefit benefit out of state corporations, and I disagree. I mean, again, you're talking about small um, independent grocery and convenience stores across the state that are going to benefit just as much. In addition to uh, the craft brew industry and the grape growing industry, they also have a, a lot to gain from this legislation. So, I think it's disingenuous to say that it's just for big box uh, stores. This benefits Oklahomans, and I will further add. This is what Oklahomans wanted. When I first started this discussion, I had a, I had a selfish reason for doing it uh, in that I really wanted cold beer. But the reality was I got hundreds of phone calls and emails from Oklahomans that said, we really would like to see wine and grocery and convenience stores now. It's time to move forward. And that's what people I think are missing is that this is what the public, the general public is asking for now. Wow, kind of wish that microphone didn't come to me right after you made that statement. Um, the problem that I have is that I'm on the ground floor, I'm on the front lines, and I'm helping those young people who are dying from the abuse of, whether, of substances. And for me, number one, to hear that you are taking that felony and putting it down to a misdemeanor, when we are putting our children, our people, our wellness of our Oklahomans in the hands of these individuals that are supposed to card people. So you you're telling me because we don't want any more felons in the, in, the, in the Oklahoma that we're going to make everything light and easy. So my question is, who's benefiting this? What are we doing with any of these dollars as far as abuse goes and helping Oklahomans where there's zero to no legislation out there that will put dollars into adolescent beds, et cetera, in the state of Oklahoma? There, there will be lots of discussions on ensuring that we're fully funding programs to ensure we don't have um, additional rates of alcohol abuse. I've had conversations with Director White. I know what she's looking for. Um, you know, it'll be a, a discussion of funding and how we get there and what, what's going to you know, be required to make sure that we don't see any additional alcohol rates, uh, alcoholism rates in Oklahoma. So uh, let me just address that in the form of that's one of the reasons we launched 791. 791, because we don't, I, I mean, I'll be honest with you personally, I don't trust the legislature to properly fund mental health. They never do. They never will. Uh, and it's not, and it's not Senator Bice's fault. And, 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 I'm, and I'm not, and I'm not laying that at Senator Bice's feet. I, I think she's a principled, honest person who cares about people. But the legislature, in general, and it is very difficult to get anything done there, as anybody who's ever been there knows. The legislature, in general, does not fund mental health. These bills, 792 and 383, do not fund mental health. 791, our proposal specifically earmarks 30% of all licensing and registration fees to go to the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse to try to offset some of the issues that you have to deal with. I think it's time to do that. Oklahoma deserves that, and we should offset alcohol access with treatment and education and enforcement. Those don't happen in 792. All right, I just have a couple things. Um, one, for all of you that weren't at the uh, ABLE meeting on Friday, uh, it was brought up earlier about adding agents. They talked about, I think it was six or eight agents that they're going to add. Ten. So, I'm sorry? Ten. Ten. So, there you go. We've got that covered. Um, secondly, you have a, as I'll speak for all of us craft beer fans. We you have a question, care. sir. I've got it coming. We don't care about Walmart carrying craft beer. Um, here we go. Mr. Kerr, in 791, and if you guys don't know this, there's a 500-foot rule for any grocery stores to have a wine license well, 500 feet from a liquor store. There ain't no secret about that. Senator Bice mentioned it earlier. Awesome. Um, I keep hearing about fairness when we talk online. And is there a provision in 791 that prevents liquor stores from selling uh, non-alcoholic products if they're within 500 feet of an operating grocery store? Uh, no, but I'd be in favor of that. Okay. Well, why didn't you add it then? Didn't think about it, but thank you. Maybe you next time we'll sit down yourself, beforehand and you it. and I can craft thank it together. A uh, question over here. Uh, yes, uh, I'm also a retail liquor store owner, but uh, no, looking at the terms that are in the uh, proposed state question, it says that a retail location will include any retail outlets which were authorized to legally sell low-point beers in effect, as of the effective date of this section. Within 
500 feet of my store are two outlets that sell beer and cigarettes and gasoline. In many states, if you're selling wine, or even in some states, strong beer, but particularly wine, you cannot sell gasoline. And one of the places is a drive through There's no provisions regarding any of those things in your state, in the legislation. And you're so concerned about us becoming a convenience store with spirits. But basically what we'll have is wine stores selling MD 2020, known as Mad Dog, which is going to get people there a lot quicker than the three-point dupe here. So can, how can you defend the 20% thing with us becoming convenience stores, but allowing convenience stores basically to become drive-through, high-point wine stores? Well, because w one, of the, one of the things I took into account was that I didn't know, think that every convenience store needed to be uh, carry wine, so the wine license fee is actually uh, significantly higher than the beer license fee. Senator, a quick question. If Senate 792 passes, what are, the, what are some of the highlights of what has to be decided in the next legislative session for this to move forward to implement it? There were a few things I think that were left out. Um, we mentioned earlier Sunday sales. We mentioned um, accompanied minors in stores. I spent 15 months really trying to get the nuts and bolts of the legislation um, through so that we didn't have significant pieces that had to be amended. So my hope is that uh, the structure is there and, you know, things like substance abuse issues, things like, um, you know, uh, licensing restrictions that we may want to put in place, those minor details can be worked through over the next two sessions, that there's nothing significant that needs to be addressed. And Mr. Kerr, if 792 passes, what do you think will happen to liquor stores? Half of them are gone. Uh, the other half will figure out a way to survive under the new environment, um, hopefully with the ability to sell ancillary items um, and some other concessions that Senator Bice has talked about this evening, including allowing minors in and, and perhaps allowing us to open on Sundays. Uh, we can become uh, th those of those that are lucky enough to not be right next to a grocery store or are, are in a good spot uh, or can survive with 30% less net income, then they will uh, become superstores and hyper serve the consumer and have um, like a total wine or a specs type uh, presentation here in Oklahoma that we'd love to do that. I know that there are several stores in Oklahoma City that could do that and would be happy to do that. And I would look forward to seeing that. Unfortunately, that comes with the loss of a whole bunch of small businesses all over the state to make that happen. So can I also, I think, follow up with one point that seems to be missed in this whole conversation, and that is not only are liquor stores going to be able to sell ancillary items and have extended hours, but as, I was, as was mentioned earlier, uh, Oklahoma consumes 86% uh, of the beer consumed in the state is 3-2 beer. So you all are going to be able to actually sell the 3-2 beer that the majority of Oklahomans are selling. So from a consumer standpoint, I may be able to go to the liquor store and buy low point beer, craft beer, alcohol, wine, ancillary items all in one stop and become a one stop shop. Senator, also, if... If 792 were not to pass, uh, do, do its supporters have another strategy, a plan B? What happens? I think I'm pretty confident that, you know, um, the public supports 792 and they want to see change. Otherwise, I wouldn't, um, I think, have taken on this initiative. It's, it's a pretty substantial amount of support that I've seen over the last year that Oklahomans are ready for something different. Please thank our guests for joining us this evening. Thank you for coming.